So uh, let's move on to the last uh, paper of this morning session by Daniele Bianchi from Queen Mary. So thanks, thanks all of you for, for being here. Thanks a lot the organizers for having our paper on the program. I really enjoyed the, the day yesterday and, and today, terrific program. I go back home with lots of readings to do and, and lots of new things to, to study. So it's a joint work with Mauro Bernardi at Padua and Nicolas Bianchi, uh, Nicolas Bianco, who uh, recently moved to uh, Pompeu Fabra. So I'm going to talk about uh, linear regressions in a high dimensional context. And the goal of the game here is to try to select which variables are in and out dynamically in your regression. So uh, before getting deeper into the uh, paper, let me just give you a little bit of an overview of what we want to do. So it's a boring univariate uh, regression, you know, y and x t minus 1, so predictive regression plus stochastic volatility. And in a static context, the idea is that a predictor can be in and out, and, you know, being static is always there or is never there. Perhaps more interesting for forecasting, uh, the beta could be time varying, right? So you have a trajectory, you could model your beta as a random walk, as an near one, you know, uh, depending on your preferences, you, you, you have a variety of choices. Now, perhaps even more interesting, you might have a situation where your beta is time varying at periods, is zero at others, and that gets time varying again after a while. And again, if you add one step of complexity, it could be time varying some predictor, maybe some others are constant and zero. Or perhaps you have a predictor that is always in, time varying, another that gets in and out at different periods of time. So uh, this is essentially what we are after. And um, there are two key issues that obviously makes the things a bit more complex. The set of predictors could be very large, potentially as large as the number of observations. And I'm alluding here a little bit to why we care about variable selection in the first place. Uh, obviously, it's not really clear ex ante which predictor matters and actually when. So the trajectory are unknown a priori. The significance is unknown likewise. And uh, uh, if you work in a dynamic context, this actually is even more relevant because if by chance you have a predictor that shouldn't be there, uh, your state space essentially accumulates noise. So the auto sample performance becomes even more detrimental. So uh, what we're going to do in this paper, we work within this context. So we have you know, large dimensional regression, time varying parameters, and things can get uh, in and out. And it's essentially a Bayesian method. So it's a Bayesian method for dynamic variable selection high dimensional time varying predictive regressions. And uh, the idea is that you might have what we call predictability at the intensive margin. So you might have single predictors that can be active for multiple periods and predictability at the extensive margin, which means that multiple predictors can be uh, relevant only for, for instance, one observation only, or you know, few, few observations. Uh, if you look at the literature, you know, people like, uh, Rochkova or uh, Hedy Bell Lopez, they make the differentiation between horizontal sparsity, which is essentially what we call intensive margin predictability, or vertical sparsity, which is what we call extensive, extensive margin predictability. The method is a novel variational based inference approach, and there are uh, above and beyond the computational efficiency, there are a couple of advantages that I'm going to lay out next. But essentially, it requires a minimal hyperparameter tuning. We, you know, as a Bayesian, is always a good thing. Try to rely as least as possible to uh, uh, prior views. I'm going to show you that the posterior concentration properties are very much the same as MCMC. So if you're worried that you know, uh, uh, we're not as accurate at MCMC, hopefully convince you that that's not necessarily the case. Set it is paribus, so using exactly the same formulation, the same, this, exactly the same MCMC counterpart. And then it's much more efficient. And by efficiency, I mean that essentially we have, we designed the algorithm so you can learn about the, tra the sparse trajectory of the predictors that are in, and automatically online, you can eventually exclude those predictors that are never in, so the noise, really. And this is the things that differentiate with respect to MCMC, because doing the same thing within an MCMC framework would be particularly complicated. Right, so we have two empirical exercises. The one that I'm going to talk about today is about inflation. So we use the FRED QD. So we have uh, roughly 230 predictors, which is relatively close to T. So it's relatively close to the number of quarters. And then in the paper, we also have an application on the equity risk premium predictability, where we use 150 anomaly-based portfolio to forecast the aggregate stock market. Uh, as I said, today I'm going to focus on inflation predictability, uh, given the theme of the, of the conference. 
So a uh, non-exhausting li list of references. I'm going to refer to the two highlighted paper, Coop and Korobilis and Rochkov and McCalling, because as far as I know, uh, those are like the most recent advancements, uh, uh, so to speak, about dynamic variable selection. Uh, Dimitris actually use a variational base, but within the context of a dynamic spike and slab. And Rochkova and, and Ken, they use uh, uh, an EM version, so expectation maximization algorithm of a spike and slab uh, uh, framework. I should also mention Nakajima and West, that you know, is, as far as I know, it was one of the first that introduced this idea of thresholding and dynamic selection of parameters. And also I should mention both Aubrey and, and Joshua, they are successfully contributing to uh, this literature on variational base inference. I strongly encourage to, to read their papers. Right, so the model. Um, as I said, it's a boring linear regression. I'm sure many of you will be disappointed by the end. So it's a dynamic Bernoulli Gaussian process. Think about that as a state space. You have your observation equation, so standard predicted regression. The state space might not necessarily be that trivial, so it's a combination of two pieces. Your beta is a combination of a time varying coefficients that are called B. Uh, and that could take any form, really. Uh, in our framework, is a random walk for reasons that will be clear in a couple of slides. But you know, if you don't like the random walk, you want to go for an air one. You all, you, you only have you know a few additional derivations to do, but can accommodate that. And then you have you know the key actual the key novelty of our setting, which is this dynamic variable indicator that I call gamma JT, which is essentially a teach ten T is a Bernoulli with a given dynamics that will be clearer uh, next. So uh, what I'm after really is this object here. So I want to have two things. I want to have an indicator gamma that tells me when the predictor is in over time, you know, dynamically. And I also want to have the corresponding beta. So on the left, you see here you know, how the gamma would eventually look like. And on the left, you see uh, how the beta, corresponding beta, would eventually look like. And I want to be uh, very clear here. The dynamics that you can capture is going to be very general. You not necessarily need that, that a process gets in and out. It could also be the equivalent of a structural break. So the beta gets in and then never gets out. So essentially changes the whole dynamics of conditional expectations, if you wish. And this is going to be uh, perhaps interesting uh, when I talk about the inflation forecasting part. So the model specification, as I said, this small beta, uh, uh, which you know, uh, together with the gamma drives the uh, slow parameters or the regression coefficients, could be any uh, anything really. Uh, we go for a, a random walk specifications. The reason being is that uh, there is a nice uh, so-called Gaussian marker random field representations, which essentially represents the joint distribution of the beta with a given precise, tight, tightly defined uh, variance covariance structure that makes the computation. Uh, quicker. In fact, you, you also have a Gaussian marker random field representation for an AR1, an AR2, and so on. Uh, but you know, for this implementation, we go for a random walk. Similarly, for stochastic volatility, we have a similar random walk representation, which is relatively standard. When it comes to stochastic volatility, you know, leaving aside all of the implications for non-stationarity that I'm fully aware of, uh, and again, you might have uh, a similar Gaussian marker random field representations. So the only parameter of interest here you have to estimate is this new square for, random, for the volatility and, and eta j square for uh, the b. Now, when it comes to the dynamics of sparsity, things become a bit trickier. So we, we, we kind of use sort of a data augmentation approach. So the idea is that gamma conditionally on an auxiliary parameter omega, which is going to be key, is essentially a Bernoulli. Um, and again, gamma has a Gaussian marker random field representation, so uh, is effectively a random walk on itself. And the parameter of interest, which I'm going to discuss a bit more carefully later on, is this uh, xi j square. Now, uh, well, it's an auxiliary parameter, so if you integrate out that omega, essentially you're going to get uh, the persistence that comes from the omega is going to be translated almost one to one with to the uh, dynamics of of the uh, gammas. So the persistence, the time series persistence of gamma, is directly driven by how much persistent uh, is the omega. Now, uh, I said at the very beginning that one of the advantages of our framework uh, is minimal set of assumptions, but I want to be fully transparent here. There are priors, obviously, you have to decide. And there is one particular prior that needs to be discussed carefully, and this is what we do in the paper, which is the uh, prior for the auxiliary parameter omega j. Because as I said, omega j uh, drives the dynamics of gamma j. And therefore, if you kind of you know, allow me the term, if you screw up that, that prior, you can screw up the posterior, posterior estimates of your gamma, and therefore of uh, omega, and therefore of gamma. 
So when it comes to um, uh, new square and eta j square, we are informative, uh, uninformative, sorry, so it's a flat prior, relatively standard. But as I said, when it comes to xi j square, we have to be careful. So I'm gonna digress a second, and I want to, uh, you know, to try to convince you that we try to be as careful as you could be, uh, still a Bayesian framework at the end, but as careful as you could be in picking up the uh, shape and scale parameters of the inverse gamma prior uh, for xi. So we look at three scenarios. One scenario is whereby we uh, have a, uh, so the scale parameter is constant and the shape parameters goes to plus infinite. And what I'm gonna show you here is, I'm gonna show you three pictures that looks the same for the next three slides. The left panel is essentially the covariance structure of omega. The mid panel is the trajectory of omega. And the right panel is the trajectory of gamma, so your indicator, whereby you see you know, the indicator in, in, in black and the true values of omega in red. So uh, if you let beta, uh, if you let b goes to plus infinite and you fix a, essentially you're gonna go to a very, you're gonna put essentially zero weight on the uh, Q inverse matrix that I showed you before. So it's essentially almost an IID framework. So almost by construction, the mid panel tells you that your omega is gonna be very erratic and as a consequence to that, your omega is gonna go all over the place. So becomes, uh, labeling becomes particularly tricky. So that's not perhaps a good choice. So scenario B, we do the opposite, uh, we fix B, so we fix the shape and we let the scale parameters go to plus infinite and we get the opposite. So we give very, very high weight on the parameter, on the uh, uh, inverse uh, of the covariance structure Q uh, inverse that I showed you before. So essentially your omega now is almost an infinitely persistent process uh, and you see that it's gonna be, you don't see the scale probably in the mid panel, but that's essentially a flat line, right? And then as a consequence to that, your omega, uh, uh, becomes you know, almost irrelevant. So you have this very, very flat dynamics and you, you really can capture much uh, when it comes to uh, the identification of your one and zero. So they, uh, they identify which predictor is in. So again, perhaps this is not a, uh, necessarily a good choice. Now, if you take the ratio of the two parameters constant, uh, whatever that number is, then things start to behave a bit more, uh, you know, more uh, sensibly. And what I'm showing you here is the covariance structure of the omega on the left again, and uh, uh, is not an IID, and is not, uh, you don't put too much weight on Q. And as a consequence, the omega parameters has a shape that is persistent, remember it's a random walk at the end, but that allows you to have a little bit of a more closer identification of the gamma parameter, so the identifier of the uh, regressor in the first place. So our recipe, so to speak, is to pick those two uh, hyperparameters, so uh, scale equal to two, shape equal to five. In fact, in the paper, we also experiment with changing the B, so changing the, the, the shape parameters. The A is fixed to two because then is, is the equivalent of a very uninformative U because the variance is plus infinite, really. So, uh, you know, given that prior formulation, so that's the only prior really we have to kind of take a view. Uh, all of the others are you know, uh, uninformative and un standard in the literature. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, variational, uh, variational Bayes inference. I'm gonna give you the highlight and the, you know, what is the basic intuition and also want to be transparent on why we pick variational Bayes in the first place. So the idea of variational Bayes is really, uh, you, know, you can think about that as a so almost like an indirect inference approach. So you have a kullback liber divergence that you have to minimize. You have a variational density that I call Q to T. And you have a, a true posterior density uh, that, you know, usual notation uh, theta given the data. Now, in a general sense, you might think about the true posterior is not observable. In fact, in our sense, is observable. In the paper, we derive also the, the exact MCMC counterpart of the variational base. It's just that for you know, computational uh, uh, reasons, we're gonna use the variational base. So um, what is the variational base that corresponds to find an optimal density that maximizes the so-called effective lower bound, which is this logarithm of P, Y, and Q. What is P, Y, and Q? is essentially a, a, a convolution of densities, really, uh, of things that you know. So Q theta is picked, so you have to you know, think about what this approximating density is, and P, Y, and theta is the joint likelihood, you know, data and parameters. You know, as far as you know the likelihood form of your model, that's okay, you have all of the ingredients uh, that you need. So the goal of the game is to maximize this object, and you, know, you can start to derive this object essentially starting from a standard base rule, uh, nothing more, nothing less. So uh, things becomes a bit tricky when you have to decide, uh, you know, the space of densities you have to you have to maximize. So uh, 
you can fall into different categories depending on the choice you make on, on, on this calligraphic queue. Uh, you may have a mean field variational base approach, which is non-parametric, and the idea is very simple. You're gonna factorize your density is in, in lots of independent pieces. So the idea, um, you know, to give you the example here, think about a, a prior for a linear regression, beat and sigma. The simplest example, at least in my mind, of a mean field is an independent prior. So you have a prior for beta and an independent prior for sigma. So you're gonna separate the two things. Now, the advantage is that you're gonna get closed form updates based on a coordinate ascent algorithm. And uh, uh, for those of you uh, who are curious, the main difference between variational bases is a stochastic optimization algorithm vis-a-vis -a, -vis a simulation based algorithm rather than MCMC. That's why, you know, I talk about coordinate as ascent rather than uh, posterior draws. Then, of course, you might have a second choice, which is this parametric variational base. Uh, the idea is that if you have views on uh, your Q being a Gaussian, then, uh, you know, uh, is a fully parametric, parametric, parametric approach. So what we do here, we combine both aspects. So we have an hybrid approach, which we call semi-parametric. Uh, the idea is that we exploit the mean field, so we factorize the densities with some caveats that I'm happy to discuss later on. Uh, but uh, also we take a parametric approach for some of these densities. And uh, for instance, when it comes to age, uh, we, we, we expand on the paper by, by Josh in the uh, recently appeared in JDC, whereby we use a fully uh, uh, coordinate ascent algorithm. And when it comes to uh, gamma and Z, uh, we use a poly gamma representation, which is essentially an auxiliary uh, parameter on top of an auxiliary parameter, but allows you essentially to speed up computation substantially. So those are the only two parametric, fully parametric choices we make uh, when it comes to the mean field factorization. Now, I'm not gonna bother you with essentially any of the propositions. I'm fully happy to discuss later on, or you know, we have full details in the paper. But I want to highlight you know, the key object of interest, which is the beta, right? The beta is a compounding process of the B, so the random walk, and the gamma, which is this, you know, weird object that comes from lots of auxiliary parameters. Now, at the end of the day, what you get is, some, is an object that is very familiar. It's essentially a mixture. So you have mixing weights for the full trajectory of one and zeros, and then you have you know, the mixing weights and a bunch of multivariate Gaussians. So conceptually, it's not necessarily that complicated. Um, so that's the only thing that I want to highlight when it comes to the uh, optimal variational densities. The other thing that I want to discuss, I made a you know, sort of a great deal at the beginning talking about computational efficiency and the fact that we can exclude parameters online during the estimates. Now I want to give you, you know, the intuition and show you a little bit of the, let's say, asymptotic properties of the algorithm and then I'll show you the algorithm uh, uh, in full in a couple of slides. So here's a proposition we have in the paper. I'm highlighting here the only thing you should really care about, which is this new, this is the uh, average of the uh, vari optimal variational density for the parameter omega. And the idea of this proposition is to show you that for small values of, uh, of this object here, keep decreasing, and at the end of the day, you're gonna converge to, uh, you never select a given predictor. So you use sparsity-inducing properties for the full trajectory of of uh, your regression parameters. Now, if that's the case, um, uh, and it is, I'm showing you here a simulation. So on the left, you have the gammas. On the x-axis, you have iterations of the algorithm. On the y-axis, you have uh, time. Uh, on the right panel, you have the omega parameter. Same thing, x-axis iterations, y-axis time. And I'm not sure you can see, but perhaps it's too transparent, but there is a dashed line here, vertical, and that's essentially the threshold. If we put a value of, let's say, 0 0.01, meaning that if the increment is you know, smaller than that, then we can stop the algorithm and claim that that predictor never, the, uh, never enters the predictor, uh, never enters the, the regression. Now, if that's the case, you can add a step to your algorithm whereby, so you know, this part is a standard, you know, uh, the equivalent, think about an MCMC, so you're gonna update your parameters, but then you add these steps here that essentially tells you within the iterations, if that parameters for some periods, some iterations never answer the regression, you just exclude it. So essentially you're gonna shrinking online the dimension of the regression. And uh, if you think about it, it's really like a you know, uh, variance inflation problem when you have noise in a, in a large OLS. It's essentially the same idea. But we do that online. And that's, you know, when it comes to the main advantage of the variational based approach, uh, doing this thing with MCMC, at least you know, for me, uh, could be particularly complicated. 
Now, I'm gonna show you the simulation study. So two things, comparison with MCMC, because that's a question that everyone asks, why don't you do MCMC? And then the comparison with uh, what we call competitive, comparative approaches. So simulation setting, uh, we have three parameters, and for the comparison with MCMC, that's, that's enough. We generate 100 replicates, and that's essentially the regressions. We have different dynamics for the three parameters. One is always in, one gets in and out, and one is never there. And I'm highlighting in blue the variational base estimates and in, in red the MCMC one. So we measure the accuracy essentially uh, based on what other people have done before, one and quarters. This is essentially the distance between your uh, uh, variational, optimal variational uh, density and the MCMC equivalent, the posterior density. Now I also want to highlight that making a comparison between variational base and MCMC is always tricky. You have to believe that your MCMC converges in the first place, and then you can always make your MCMC faster or slower, depending on how accurate it should be. Uh, there is less, less variation in the variational base, but you know, it's always so. What I'm showing you here is as good as it gets, but you could, I'm sure you could do you could better. So I'm showing you here uh, uh, in this panel uh, an example of a trajectory, and then uh, essentially the, the, this trajectory in a box chart sense for all of the 100 simulation, and that's for beta one on top and gamma one uh, at the bottom. So this is a parameter that is always in, so never, never becomes zero. It's a time varying parameters, and I want to highlight you know, essentially one thing, the accuracy of gamma one, accuracy compared to MCMC. So when it gets close to 100, it means that you are as accurate as, as the MCMC. And the accuracy of beta one. You see that the accuracy is not necessarily the same for reasons that perhaps uh, is clear if you look at here. So being a simulation-based sampler, you always draw a small amount of probability from the, uh, uh, if you think about a spike and slab, from the spike, so from the zero. Uh, while in a stochastic optimization setting, it's like having a very hard uh, thresholding constraint. So is either zero uh, or not? Now we have a, a second example whereby is a constant at zero, so it's always zero. And again, the efficiency of variational base perhaps is clearer here. Essentially, variational base is, uh, you know, flat, very tight density around zero, while MCMC being, uh, you know, uh, uninformative, which was uninformative prior to compare Apple with Apple, uh, is less efficient. So you still have probability mass that are well, well outside zero. So uh, it usually takes much more time than expected. So uh, what I want to do now, I briefly mentioned the uh, uh, comparison with um, uh, standard uh, methodologies, and then I walk you through the, you know, the, the main results. So comparison, we have uh, uh, 1,500 or 200 variables, 200 observations consistent with empirical analysis. We have some parameter that is always in, for instance, beta one, think about an intercept. Some parameters that varies over time with different types of, of uh, dynamics and parameters from the eight to the uh, 50 or 100 on 200 that are never there. And we compare different variations of our algorithm. We also compare against, against uh, rolling window static, normal gamma, or shoe spike and slab methods, dynamic spike and slab, and, and, and in Ken, as in Ken and Rochkova, uh, with different parameter choices and the uh, dynamic variational uh, base of Coop and Korobilis. Uh, we compare the F1 score and the uh, computing, computing time and show you the F1 score now. So this is when the parameters is always in. So all of the, uh, um, uh, all of the uh, algorithms do a relatively uh, good job. But what happens when you have a single switch, so it goes from zero to significant only once, obviously as you would expect, these are only the rolling window, those in grays. Those are the competitive dynamic approaches, and those are all of the hours. So the left, pair, the left panel is hours, mid panel is compare, uh, like dynamic competitive approaches, right panel is the rolling window. As you would expect, the rolling window deteriorates. You know, if you go to 200 variables, so there is a lot of noise, rolling window essentially uh, goes all over the place. Now, another scenario, we have uh, two switches, so parameters can be in and out for twice uh, over the sample. And again, rolling window does uh, relatively poorly. And again, if you, if you increase the noise in, in your set of access, things go all over the place. We also have a case in which we have a very tight signal. This switches there, will be nice. 
Okay, so is a signal that is very short lived, and this is going to be important in empirical application. And again, uh, 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 we kind of outperform uh, competing approaches. Computational time is faster. Let me talk about uh, inflation of forecasting. So what we're going to have here, we're going to have four different targets, one, two, four, and eight quarters ahead for four different measures of inflation, 230 predictors, forecasting benchmark is going to be the local level model of Stock and Watson plus stochastic volatility and the time varying parameter AR2. In fact, sorry, there is a typo as in Coop and Corobilis. Uh, we take a fully you know, real-time recursive forecast approach. Before discussing the forecast, I want to forecast what is the in-sample narrative of the dynamic parameters, because I, mean, I personally care to understand where things are coming from. So what I'm showing you here is the surviving predictors for the total CPI. And uh, at least to me, some of these parameters make sense. For instance, if I look at industrial production, that, that is more on the supply side, you know, it's positive for a given part of the sample, that interest in becomes negative towards the end of the sample. The AR1 becomes significant only up to the uh, 90s. And then things that perhaps are more interesting for me, you have the demand side, so that's uh, 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 personal consumption expenditures. Uh, and then you have monetary policy, that's the five years uh, treasury rates. And this is the sort of a, you can think about there is a pass through. This is the uh, PPI, um, uh, one of the PPI's indexes that positively correlates with future total CPI. On the top, you see the betas. At the bottom, you see the indicators. This is for total CPI. If you look at the PCE deflators, which essentially is a broader measure of, of, of inflation, some of the variables are the same. Uh, some others get excluded. For instance, lag one is always there, monetary policy. Is, is there a uh, positive correlation with PPI and industrial production uh, is there. Now, I mentioned about the short-lived uh, uh, dynamics before, and this is what we found, for instance, for the GDP deflator, uh, which takes into account not only consumption, uh, consumption inflations, but you know, much broader. This is essentially the uh, industrial production for final goods at the, uh, you know, at the end of the first lockdown, really. You have this spike, which I really don't have much clue of where it's coming from. You know, Hope the macroeconomists in the room help me to understand it better. The other thing that I want to highlight, this is short-term unemployment, and you know you can think about that as a sort of a reviving the Phillips curve uh, for a given part of the sample. Uh, now, I, talk about, uh, I want to talk about briefly in the last minute that I have on forecasting. So in terms of forecasting performances, we, we compare favorably with all of the methods except the usual suspects, so the stock and what's local level. Uh, it's hard to be that, that framework. But the thing that I want to highlight, we also do uh, the Bolbariano tests. Uh, our framework is the first two columns of each of the sub-panels. If it's blue, we outperform. The y-axis, if it's uh, white, we don't. And the only white uh, boxes on top is the unobserved component model of Stock and Watson. In predicted density sense, uh, is similar. Uh, now the benchmark changes. It's a time varying air to with stochastic volatility because it's the one that is best performing. The uh, punchline here is that all of the other methods that use macro variables, uh, we outperform. We outperform those. So in concluding, apologies for, for taking some, some extra minute. Uh, what we have here, we have a dynamic variable selection framework for time varying predicted regressions, which is, I haven't much time to talk about computation, but it's uh, fast and scalable, and it's competitive in terms of post, uh, accuracy with respect to MCMC. We're thinking about some generalizations, for instance, generalized linear models, group variable selections, and change the dependent structure, maybe regular time points, spatial data networks. It's pretty flexible. So thanks, thanks a lot for the attention. I'm looking forward to another discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Let's indeed move to uh, the discussion carried out by Hannah Simone. So first of all, I would like to, to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me to discuss this uh, very nice paper. So uh, yeah, so I really enjoyed uh, reading it. Uh, it's a very interesting paper. So the um, Okay, so I will start with a brief summary, and then I will uh, I will uh, present my points. Uh, so the aim of this paper is uh, to predict uh, the dynamics of economic variables. So this can be uh, useful, for instance, if you want to forecast uh, inflation or uh, forecast uh, asset returns. And uh, uh, the setting is a setting where uh, you have a large number of predictors. And, uh, and where uh, the relevance of each pre predictor may change uh, over time. Okay, so we have uh, a sparsity uh, which potentially vary over time. Okay, so the the model that they use uh, that they propose is the following. Um, 
So they consider a, a Gaussian time varying parameter regression model uh, where we have uh, a Gaussian error term and uh, a p dimensional parameter beta t tilde. And uh, so p might be large, so a large number of, uh, of uh, predictors. And uh, so large compared with n, so we, we are in a high dimensional setting. And um, so high dimension, so the first point is uh, to deal with high dimension. So uh, they also deal with high dimension by assuming sparsity. And then uh, they have to deal with uh, time varying sparsity. Okay, so this is very interesting. And uh, they propose uh, the following prior. So basically my, uh, my discussion will, uh, will focus on the prior. So this is a very dense paper. Okay, so there are many interesting things. Mary. And uh, so I, I um, I've chosen to, to focus on the prior. Um, so what they do, first of all, is uh, to reparameterize, okay? So they, they write the, the beta t tilde, okay? The product of, uh, okay, it's here, uh, of a diagonal matrix gamma t that contains indicators gamma jt, uh, which can be uh, either zero or one with the given probabilities, prior probabilities, times uh, uh, beta t. Okay, and then uh, they endow it with, uh, with a prior uh, that is a Bernoulli Gaussian uh, prior uh, in the sense that they have a random work for beta JT. Um, and then, uh, uh, so they have a stochastic volatility. Uh, and uh, so what is uh, uh, the main contribution is this uh, uh, prior for uh, gamma JT, okay, for this uh, indicator that tells us whether the J's uh, predictor is active or not. And uh, so this is uh, Bernoulli with a, with a probability PJT uh, that is related through this uh, logit uh, um, functions to this parameter omega JT. Uh, and this omega JT, okay, is, uh, uh, it is uh, an element of this, uh, uh, so this is not is n, sorry, of this n plus one uh, vector, which is uh, Gaussian, okay? And uh, so the components of omega j are correlated through this matrix Q minus one, as we have just seen in the presentation by Daniele. And uh, so this, uh, this correlation is carried on the, uh, the, the, the joint distribution of the gamma j's, uh, once we integrate out uh, the PJT um, uh, with respect to, to the prior, okay? And then there are priors on hyperparameter. Then what they do is to propose a semi-parametric variational base algorithm, and uh, they use the two assumptions. Uh, assumptions on the set, so there is a set of approximating densities, so the set over which the Kullback library divergence is minimized, and what they assume is that there is a mean field factorization, and they assume some parametric approximation for the density of H and uh, for the probability of these uh, indicators. So the main novelty of this prior, um, uh, with respect to what has been proposed in the existing literature, is the prior of this uh, uh, gamma JT, in the sense that uh, this prior allows persistency through the, uh, the correlation, okay? So in the, the, the marginal prior of gamma JT has, um, has correlated, I mean, the, the, the components are correlated. Uh, so my first question, I mean, this is just a clarification question that was not clear to me uh, in the paper, whether the first component of the gamma J vector can be zero, uh, or it is always uh, assumed to be active. Uh, then I have, uh, uh, so what I've done is to, um, to think about this prior, okay? So I really wanted to understand what is the probabilistic structure of this prior. Uh, so actually, we can rewrite uh, this prior um, by using the spike and slab formulation. So I was wondering whether this can be interesting, whether you can present your prior in this alternative way. So basically, so by using this uh, spike and slab formulation, so you have your uh, original parameter beta tilde. Okay, so this is the par yeah, you don't see. Uh, this is the parameter that is in the model. Okay, and the condition uh, is here. Uh, so conditional on the beta jt minus. So, so remember that this beta tilde is uh, 
they composed in the product of gamma JT times beta JT uh, T, okay? And uh, so what, uh, uh, so the, the prior can be written as a conditional prior of beta tilde JT given beta JT minus one, so the past values, and the gamma JT, so the, the, the current value of the indicator. So this is a mixture of a Gaussian and a Dirac measure in zero. Okay, so uh, this, uh, the spike part, okay, so this Dirac uh, does not depend on the past, on the previous values of beta JT minus one, while the slab part depends on this beta JT minus one. <coughs> but actually, uh, it doesn't depend on, uh, on beta tilde JT T minus one, but on beta JT minus one, okay? Uh, so this means that uh, it doesn't depend on the fact that the previous component is active or not, okay? Uh, so this means that uh, uh, implicit in this formulation is this assumption that conditional on gamma JT and on uh, beta JT minus one, the beta J at times T tilde is independent on the, on the gamma G uh, at the previous time, at times T minus one, okay? So this means, oh wow, only three minutes, that the past <laughs> sparsity pattern affects the value of beta tilde JT only through this gamma JT. Then, uh, once we integrate out uh, uh, gamma JT, and once we integrate out again B, PJT, then we have that the, the, the past uh, values, so meaning the past uh, sparsity patterns uh, affect the beta JT tilde. And then I have compared this prior with the two priors that are uh, uh, mentioned in the paper, the Coop and Corobilis prior and the uh, Rochkov and McCallin prior. Uh, so both these priors are uh, soft spike and slab prior, okay, soft in the sense that they are a mixture of two uh, non-degenerate priors. So for instance, if you look at the Rochkov and McCallin prior, uh, the first one, this is a slab uh, prior, the, the, the slab part, okay, this can be taken, for instance, as a, as a Gaussian, and the second one is, uh, it can be taken equal to Laplace. So the... Uh, the first difference, for instance, uh, second difference with respect to the prior in the paper is that this, uh, uh, the mean of this uh, psi one of this uh, slab part, okay, is not uh, uh, a random walk, okay, but it is a autoregressive of order one with parameter phi one smaller than one. So my first question is the motivation for taking phi one equal to one. And uh, also another difference is that uh, uh, gamma JT in this prior, in the Rochkov and McCallin prior, depends explicitly on the previous value of beta JT minus one tilde, okay? So it depends explicitly on the sparsity pattern of, uh, uh, of the beta J parameter. So what, it, what could be interesting is to compare um, the persistence of the sparsity pattern induced by these two priors, okay? So your prior and the prior of Rochkov and McCallin. Uh, then uh, I have other question. Maybe I, mm, I skip the first one g given the time. So, um, so my first question uh, is about. So you you mentioned the fact that you have a small number of hyperparameters, meaning that you are using a random walk instead of an AR, R1, and then you have two uh, less para hyperparameters to select. But the question is, uh, what if the true beta t tilde uh, is not persistent? Okay, so it doesn't satisfy the random walk assumption. And in particular, in your simulation, you, you take phi one equal to 0.98, so we are very close to a random walk. So it, it could be interesting to see situations where phi one is much smaller than one, how your method perform compared to, to, to the alternative priors. And then how large n can be. So in your, you, in your simulation, you set n equal to 100, I think. But I would be uh, interested in seeing what happens, so, uh, how the results are affected by changing uh, n, by increasing n. And also, you could look at the correlation between predictors. Okay, so if the predictors are correlated, how this impacts your results. 
Then the second thing that I have done is to rethink a little bit the model uh, by relating to something I'm working on uh, currently. Uh, so we could uh, reinterpret uh, this uh, time varying parameter models, uh, one minute, yeah, in terms of groups. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, uh, each covariate J defines a group, okay? Uh, so the beta tilde J is a group with n plus one uh, components and that can be decomposed in the product of a diagonal matrix gamma j times beta j, but now the, the, the elements of this uh, diagonal matrix are no longer indicators, but uh, they are standard deviations. And uh, so what is the main uh, difference here? The main difference is that you can allow a group to be uh, inactive, okay? So this uh, um, account for the situations where you have uh, many predictors, but uh, some predictor is never active, okay? So you can exclude it directly. And uh, this is what uh, we call uh, bi-level sparsity, okay? So in this, your paper, you have uh, uh, one-level sparsity, okay? But uh, you could have a sparsity at the group level and within the group, okay? So in particular, um, in a, in a recent working paper with Matteo Mogliani, we have a, um, we have a prior, okay, that induces a double um, sparsity, okay, which we call it, it's, it's a double spike and slab. So uh, if you use this uh, interpretation in terms of groups, I was wondering, uh, uh, I mean, uh, how, how the two priors perform. And I think that it would be nice to, to make this comparison. Uh, so to have a prior that induces uh, a one level sparsity versus a prior that induces a bi-level sparsity. And so how it, um, how it performs in terms of efficiency and how it performs in terms of uh, computational uh, efficiency. Okay, so I stop here. Thank you. Many thanks, Anna. We have time for one or two questions. One over there. I go in. Okay. Uh, Daniele, uh, why you don't compare by the spike and slab by John Donnell lens and premature the econometrical one? And what are the differences? And also, based on what Massimiliano was doing yesterday within the BART, he, they made this picture in simulation where there was no time variation that was jumping. And I was asking if you compare with them or, or what's happening there. And, but in particular, the spike and slab by, I think you know the paper, we know the paper. And what is the differences, and, and maybe because you compare just with Rochkova, that's that's all. Very interesting paper. I'm curious uh, to get your thoughts. Uh, why in this very rich environment, you can not you you don't beat uh, Stock and Watson? So, I guess. Uh, my question is, did you try to do like a, sub, a subsample analysis? Probably in the 90s is when uh, Stock and Watson was very difficult to beat, but in the 2010s with the revival of the Phillips curve, maybe that's when the method that you have a better chance. How easy would it be to um, incorporate economic restrictions on the coefficients, say, uh, motivated from economic theory? Okay, so uh, last one. Okay, go ahead. Just I want to ask if you have the risk to um, cancel out one regressor at the beginning because it's time varying, then maybe one regressor could be interested, you know, after the financial crisis, but you already discard it. So since you have this dimension reduction, and so this, this may be a risk, right? Okay, so Daniele, maybe if you. So thanks, can... thanks, thanks a lot, Anna, for the very nice discussion. I like a lot the the the, the Spike and Slab uh, uh, counterpart, and this is something that I honestly have to think about it uh, because Dimitris does exactly that. So it's a dynamic Spike and Slab, which is a kind of IID almost, uh, but that's. Uh, so I have to think about it. All of the other things, in terms of the correlated predictors, we do have in the new set of simulations. Uh, we also look at correlated predictors. We look at 200 predictors, so results are kind of, uh, you know, s similar. Um, I also like the idea of, com you know, looking at the computational cost, depending on how many zeros you actually have in the regression. So these are all points well taken. And so 
Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot. Regarding the question, so we do compare with the Janona lens of premature static. So we also compare with, you know, horseshoe, normal gamma, all the others. So, I mean, um, so it's static. So it's not directly comparable. The benchmark is Rochkova, Mechalin, and Dimitris because it's the only dynamic really variable selection. But we compare in simulations, uh, sorry, in empirical analysis, and we, uh, we outperform. Um, in terms of unobserved component, very good question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, my guess is because there is almost zero estimation error. It's a local level plus stochastic volatility what we use. So you know, if you throw in you know, some noise also in the macro variables that ultimately affects. So in fact, when we saw that we kind of compared, uh, I was kind of happy enough because at least we have a story, not just a time very mean. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm fully with you. Perhaps we could look at different subsets. Economic restrictions, I don't know. How easy, how difficult could be? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I need to look into it. Dimension reduction. So the so we proved the we have a small theoretical part where we show that we exclude the predictors only if it doesn't matter for the full trajectory, not just at the beginning. So if a predictor doesn't matter never, and after a few iterations, the algorithm tells you that is never there, you just discard it uh, because you take out noise and then supposedly makes the estimates more efficient. Uh, and reduce online the dimensionality and so on. But yeah, that's not a risk for us. So uh, thanks a lot to all the speakers and discussion of this uh, morning uh, session. Uh, yeah, that deserve a